This man was the Democratic nominee for president in the year 1984. He served as vice president in the late 70s, and in the very early 1970s, as you see him here in all his early 1970s glory, uh, he was a senator, Senator Walter Mondale, Democrat of Minnesota. Mr. Mondale entered the U.S. Senate at the beginning of our national war on poverty under LBJ. Senator Mondale outlasted President Johnson in office, but he kept working on that basic idea of using public policy to help up the least well-off among us. By 1971, he succeeded in getting passed, with big bipartisan support, a bill that would have created a daycare system, essentially, in this country. Universal preschool for American kids. The tuition was on a sliding scale so everybody could afford it. Senator Mondale got his bill passed, and it went to the guy who was president by then. It went to Richard Nixon, and Richard Nixon vetoed it, even though it had passed with lots of Republican votes. President Nixon said the idea of preschool for everyone had, quote, family-weakening implications. He said, quote, the child development envisioned in this legislation would be truly a long leap into the dark for the United States government and the American people. A long leap into the dark. Uh, Forty years after President Nixon said no to preschool for all American kids with the weird leaping in the dark analogy, President Obama is trying to bring a version of that idea back with a plan for early education for all Americans. But this time, the president has wind in his sails blowing in from an unlikely source. It's blowing in from a really, really red state, from maybe the reddest of all red states. This is how Oklahoma voted in 2012. Mitt Romney swept every county. In 2008, John McCain swept every county. In 2004, George Bush swept every county. Oklahoma is the reddest place we've got in America. And Republicans, you may have heard, like to think that they do not think much of the policy ideas of President Barack Obama, which is why it was so interesting to hear the two states that President Obama mentioned as models when he announced his State of the Union plan for preschool. Tonight, I propose working with states to make high quality preschool available to every single child in America. In states that make it a priority to educate our youngest children, like Georgia or Oklahoma, studies show students grow up more likely to read and do math at grade level, graduate high school, hold a job, form more stable families of their own. Today, President Obama took that proposal on the road, visiting a pre-K class, pre-kindergarten class in Decatur, Georgia. He played a game of I Spy with the kids there. Notice the magnifying glass, Nancy Drew style. He did some phonics. He did the kinds of things that you do in pre-K, if they have pre-K where you live, uh, like they do in Georgia. Georgia is a conservative state. But no state is conservative like Oklahoma is, right? And yet, Oklahoma has had universal pre-kindergarten since the late 1990s, and they got it in the most amazing way. The story starts with this guy, Joe Eddins. He's a rancher, a biology teacher, an Oklahoma state representative, and that rarest of all Oklahoma political critters, Joe Eddins is a Democrat. Um, at the time Mr. Eddins first got into office in 1994, Oklahoma schools were already putting four-year-olds in school because the law allowed them to, and because a glitch in state law said that inadvertently Oklahoma schools would get paid for having extra kids enrolled in kindergarten. Well, they started putting four-year-olds in kindergarten, and it turned out that putting pre-kindergarten-aged kids in kindergarten classes didn't necessarily suit those kids all that well. So Mr. Eddins proposed closing the loophole that let four-year-olds be in Oklahoma's kindergarten classrooms. But when he did that, he snuck in way deep in the legislative thicket of the therefores and the hereby withs, he snuck in an entire new grade, a pre-kindergarten, just for those kids that he just kicked out of kindergarten for being too young to be there. In doing so, he gave Oklahoma the most successful pre-kindergarten education program in the entire United States of America. And it was all done kind of on the QT. Joe Eddins, Oklahoma state rep, hoped that nobody would catch on to what he was doing, but it worked. Oklahoma's pre-K kids got a chance to learn their letters and their numbers and their colors and how you wait your turn and you take only your own graham cracker and you nap when you are told to nap. On the world's greatest radio show, This American Life, our friend Alex Bloomberg um, got a chance to ask Joe Eddins about how this all happened, about his sneak bill. Alex asked whether Mr. Eddins could have gotten this thing done in Oklahoma if people had really known what he was doing at the time he was doing it. Listen. I don't see it ever uh, 
being funded if you had to, like other states do, if you had to say, here's a program that we want to implement, uh, here's how much money it'll take, Whoo, where are you going to get the money, okay? You know, where if you would have to have a line item of, uh, appropriation, um, nobody would have supported it except the young mothers, and they have no political clout. What lessons could other states, say other states want to try to do something like this? A prayer. They don't have a prayer. They don't have a prayer uh, because it's expensive. And there's, uh, the state legislatures are run by people that don't want to, they want to cut programs, not add programs. Those other states haven't got a prayer of getting what Oklahoma kids got. What Oklahoma kids got by stealth, and now Oklahoma loves Oklahoma loves it because kids in Oklahoma, just a few years into this, started making truly long leaps in their letters and their spelling and their problem solving. Oklahoma kids made truly long leaps. Black kids, white kids, Native American kids, Hispanic kids, everybody. It really worked. And yes, it costs money to do this. But the academics who track this stuff say that the earlier you invest in a child's development, the more you get back. They say that this is among the smartest money you can spend in public policy. And that was President Obama's case this week. We know this works. So let's do what works and make sure none of our children start the race of life already behind. Let's give our kids that chance. We know this works. Specifically, we know this works in the reddest of all of the red states. We are not used to policy being extrapolated from Oklahoma to the whole country. And I do not mean to offend Oklahoma with that statement. It just doesn't really happen. But could this be the time? With this Democratic president saying, hey, you know what? Georgia and Oklahoma are doing it right, and the whole country should follow their lead. Could it work? After all, Richard Nixon is not going to veto it this time. Joining us now is James Heckman. He's a Nobel Prize winner and professor of economics at the University of Chicago. He is an advocate for the idea that you can increase equality by investing more in very little kids. Professor Heckman, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's my pleasure. I had to be here. Uh, in the states that have the kind of program that the president is calling for, are there any lessons to be learned, clear lessons, about what works and what doesn't work? What might be extrapolatable to a larger, uh, larger platform or to other states? Well, it's not just a question of these particular states, although they're models and they provide an example. But there are many programs that have been evaluated for many, many years where we can see what the economic and social benefits are of these programs. And so I think it's important to draw lessons from a broader uh, portfolio of uh, policies that have been implemented. What, is, um, what explains or what is it about these, uh, these programs that is so economically beneficial? What gives us the, such a bang for the buck is the way we uh, think of this as a policy matter? You're asking for the particulars of why they work or mm -hmm. just how, how it's evaluated? Or how we, how we know that they work. Well, we know they work because we've actually done experiments where we give people these programs at randomly assign them and others are not randomly assigned and we follow these people for as long as 40 or 50 years in their lifetimes to see what the benefits are of these programs in terms of their income in terms of their participation in crime even in terms of their health and in terms of their schooling and in many other dimensions of social performance are there specific aspects of the type of pre-k or early education um, that have larger benefits later on. I mean, pre-K education can be lots of different things. Um, lots of different states have different standards. Do we know anything about what is most important about getting it right if you want to get those kind of benefits? Well, getting it right involves putting quality into the program. There's no question. You can't do it on the cheap. That's for sure. What, is, um, what, is, what, what do you look for in terms of quality education? What are you spending more money to get? Well, we have to understand what these programs are doing. These programs are working with children and with families and they're supplementing the family lives of disadvantaged children. That's really the ingredient. The successful ingredient is really asking how you can replicate for disadvantaged children the kind of advantages that more that uh, children from wealthier and uh, upper class environments come from. Get, how, get how does that speak to the prospect of having this as a universal benefit, something that kids of all different uh, advantage levels or economic strata, uh, all sorts of different demographic orientations, how does it speak to that um, being something that everybody gets if it disproportionately benefits kids who are from more soft backgrounds? Well, first of all, you have to understand, as you said in yourself in your, in your introduction, 
the proposed idea, I guess going back to Walter Mondale, was a sliding fee schedule. Mm -hmm. So everybody could have access to these programs. But the, but, the, but the payment would vary depending on the income level and the degree of disadvantage. In terms of the politics here, I know that you're not a political scientist in these matters, but no. do you think there is a, uh, do, do you think that there is an economically and scientifically sound argument to make uh, to counter the uh, political conservative concerns that this is going to supplant family life in some way that's going to undermine family living. Is there something that we know from the data that could be used politically in that argument? See, what's interesting, I hadn't realized this quotation you read from uh, Richard Nixon. It's just the opposite. These programs are actually bolstering family life. We know that one of the biggest challenges, and something President Obama and many politicians can't say, one of the biggest challenges in American society is the changing family environment especially for disadvantaged kids. A lot of kids are born into environments where they're not getting the same stimulation. Single parent families where the mothers are high school dropouts or not very well educated are not getting the same benefits as children from more advantaged homes. And that has consequences. And we can remedy some of those uh, deficits and we can actually improve those consequences by giving those children the kind of, uh, at least some, some version, supplementing the family life and giving them some of the same opportunities and working with both the parents and the children. This is really a family strategy and this shouldn't be a, a, a liberal Demo or Democrat uh, versus Republican strat uh, conflict. This should really be something that should resonate with people who value and, and talk a lot about family values and also people who are interested in inequality and reducing inequality. This is one of the rare public policies that has two features. It's economically productive, it survives very stringent analyses, and at the same time, uh, it reduces inequality and promotes social mobility. James Heckman, Nobel Prize winning professor of economics at the University of Chicago. Um, it's fascinating to have your perspective on this. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Okay, I really appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Right. Okay. That last point that he made, I think uh, somebody should cut that into a YouTube clip and send it to everybody they know on Facebook, maybe. Maybe we'll do that in the commercial break. Now I'm busy. We'll be right back.